Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Jalriza Mansuri. Dr. Mansuri is a board-certified OBGYN. She is also a member of the Washington Township Medical Foundation. The topic today will be about human papillomavirus. So you probably have got, had a pap smear going to your gynecologist and you've gotten your pap report. And aside from saying that your pap smear is negative, you're gonna also have uh, information on the report that says HPV not detected. And of course, the HPV we're talking about is human papillomavirus. Why is it so important? Why are we checking for it when you get your pap smear? Well, it's important because it is the most common STD or sexually transmitted disease in the United States. There are over 200 types of HPV viruses. They're, they all kind of, kind of give it a number. 40 types of HPV are responsible for causing infection in our anogenital areas. Anogenital being the vagina, the vulva, the anal area. So HPV infections, we typically can kind of fight it off with our own natural immune system. Most infections will kind of go away on their own within about six to 12 months, especially if you have a healthy immune system. HPV, human papillomavirus, are also responsible for common warts. HPV can be spread from skin to skin contact. So if you know what the warts are like the cauliflower looking fleshy bumps that we can get on our skin, on our fingers, on our faces, uh, sometimes on the undersides of our feet. And uh, funny enough, I never heard of this until I, I really kind of did more research into this talk, but there's also something called butcher's warts, which is warts that individuals can get when they handle a lot of raw meat, like raw chicken. HPV can also infect our genital areas. So HPV can cause, certain types of them can cause genital warts. Genital warts are, are benign lesions, they're benign skin conditions, but they can be bothersome and, and embarrassing for patients. What I'm more concerned about as an OBGYN is to teach patients more about the association of human papillomavirus and precancers and cancers of the cervix, vagina, vulva, anus, and even the throat. And when I say vulva, I mean the outer vagina, such as the labia. The good news is all of the scary talk about HPV and being a common STD, there is an available vaccine in the United States. It protects against nine types of HPV. So how common is HPV? In the United States, the estimated prevalence of HPV infection among females is about 20 million. Every year, the incidence of new HPV infections in females is about 5.5 million. In males, it's a little bit different, probably because the studies used for information use different methods of collecting HPV as well as collected from different areas. But the prevalence in males can range anywhere from 1% to 73% of any given population. There is, however, even with this big range in the males, um, as well as, as certain female populations, there is an association with increasing or riskier sexual activity and catching HPV. Basically, the more sexual partners you have, the higher the chance you're gonna be exposed to a high-risk form of HPV. From the OBGYN standpoint, I do wanna mention a little bit more about cervical cancer because cervical cancer is unique. It's different from the other types of female genital tract cancers. It has a different process from ovarian cancer, uterine cancer. Basically, all cervical cancers arise from an HPV infection with a high-risk form of HPV. 
So you kind of need HPV infection, human papillomavirus, in order to, over time, develop cervical cancer. We've done really well with cervical cancer because of the pap smear. So over the last half a century, we've really been able to decrease the rates of cervical cancer. It used to be one of the more common forms of cancer in the U.S., but now it's down to the 14th most common cancer in women. So every year, it's about 12,000 to 13,000 women that get diagnosed with cervical cancer. The United States is very, re we're very resource rich. Many of us, compared to other countries, have good access to medical care. But in the world, it's the fourth most common form of cancer in women. In the U.S., about a little over 4,000 women will die from cervical cancer. And around the world, it's the fourth most common. So as I said, mentioned earlier, pap smears have really helped to decrease the rate of cervical cancer. So it's uh, something I, I keep recommending for our female patients to get on a regular basis. And I'll talk more about the frequency Okay, so a little bit more about how we get human papillomavirus. So viruses are different from bacteria. So if we get a bacterial infection, for example, like pneumonia, we can fight it off with antibiotics. Viruses are different. There's not really a medicine we can give you to fight off a viral infection. For example, if you get the cold, you can take medicines to alleviate the symptoms, but your body kind of has to just get rid of the virus on its own. So how HPV infects us is usually through our, our skin surfaces. For example, on our hands, our arms, our legs, it's a keratinized skin, it's sort of dry, but there are also surfaces that are more moist. Those, for example, inside our mouth, in the vagina, in the anus and rectum. We call those skin surfaces more mucosa. So basically, HPV can kind of enter through breaks in the layers of the skin mucosa. If the virus is able to get down the basal layer, the lower part, and infect these cells, then that's when they can kind of wreak their havoc. A virus like HPV is a DNA virus. And one of the things that it can do is it can embed itself in our own DNA so that every time these cells divide, the virus DNA also gets replicated with our own cells. The time when it becomes kind of harmful and can lead to uh, cancer is when it starts expressing some of its proteins. The scary proteins are these two, E6 and E7, because these proteins interact with tumor suppressor genes in our cells. And that's exactly what those genes do. They suppress tumors. So what these proteins can do is when they turn off these tumor suppressor genes, they can lead to what's called immortalization of these cells. That means that even if these cells are abnormal or are meant to, to eventually die, they won't. They'll just keep dividing and keep growing, and hence that's where you can have abnormal growth that can lead to cancer over the long term. And the amount of time usually to go from a high-risk HPV infection and the changes that you have to have in order to develop cancer really takes years. So it's not, it's not an immediate process, and that's why we don't check for HPV or even do a pap as often as uh, some, some of my patients think we should. <laughs> All right, so these are just pictures of common warts. You may have seen them on kids especially. By the time kids start going to school, they'll start sharing toys, touching each other. Oftentimes, these, will, these are short-lived. They'll go away on their own. They'll slough off. If not, they're easily treatable with things like salicylic acid. They can be uh, frozen with liquid nitrogen. It just gives us an idea of how ubiquitous human papillomaviruses. The types of HPV that cause these types of infections are usually HPV 1 and 2. This is more of warts on the anal area, and it's these lesions right here. This is a little bit more of a severe warty growth. This is something that we call condyloma acuminata. And as you can see, that can kind of be, even though it's benign, it's not cancer, it could be uncomfortable and, of course, embarrassing. I'd like to go into this, even though you might already know, because I get a lot of patients that think that when they get a pelvic exam, that they're, that they're also automatically getting a pap smear. Well, that's not the case. A pelvic exam is, is just really looking at the outer vagina, the inner vaginal canal, and the top of the vagina, which is the cervix. So this kind of is a picture that shows her anatomy. It is the female genital tract, and we're looking at it from the front. So this here is the vagina. 
This little bump here is the cervix. It's the opening to the uterus. Basically, it's what needs to stay closed when we are pregnant, and it's what needs to dilate open when it's time to have the baby, the uterus. This is where our endometrium is. This is where the blood comes from when we're having our period and it comes out. And of course, it's also where the baby would grow. Here are our fallopian tubes. This is where egg and sperm would meet in the process of fertilization. These are our ovaries right here. We have two, one on either side. The ovaries are very crucial. They have our primordial eggs. We're born with all the eggs we're gonna have. The ovaries not only provide us with our eggs and our ability to bear children, should that be something we wanna do, but they also produce hormones, our estrogen and progesterone. So, but to go back to the topic at hand, when we do a pelvic exam, we look at the outer vagina because there could be rashes and lesions, and yes, also HPV infection that can occur in the outer vagina, as well as the canal of the vagina. But the HPV effects on cervix is, is probably greater. The high-risk HPV effects on, on cervix and causing cancer is, is a greater effect, a greater burden as well. And so that's just this bump right here. It's a very, very small structure in our body. So when, we, when we're doing a pap smear, we're actually just getting tissue just from that area right there. This is actually what we're looking at or what we're seeing when we have a speculum inside the vagina and it's open. This is what we're seeing. This is a normal looking cervix right here. So as you can see, it kind of looks like a donut. This is the canal of the cervix. That is where the period blood comes out of every month when we're having our menstruation. In this area, there's something called a transformation zone. It's the border between two types of surfaces, sort of the border between the smooth pink surface of the outer vagina and the more lumpy, bumpy columnar surface of the inside of the cervical canal. That transformation zone is, is oftentimes where HPV human papillomavirus will wreak its havoc and, and basically cause changes that over many years time can lead to cancer. So this is a normal cervix. This is a cervix with signs of infection by HPV. And it's not this, that's actually normal, but it's this whitish, whitish change right here. These whitish changes are signs of precancer of HPV. If HPV keeps progressing, here's a more severe form. As you can see, there's a big whitish plaque up here. And that is a sign of what we call cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. So basically pre-cancer, not quite cancer, but, but getting there. This is more a case of cervical cancer. I picked this picture because it has uh, the word regression here. The changes caused by HPV can be reversed, but there's not a medicine or anything that we can give you for that to happen. You're, basically, it's a process where the immune system can fight off HPV and eventually those changes can re regress back. Things that kind of make that process harder to happen though is smoking. So smoking we know is a promoter of cervical dysplasia or precancer as well as cervical cancer. So if you have a high risk HPV infection and you're a smoker, it'll increase your chance of going in this direction. So I, I know I'm talking a lot about the pap smear, but again, I just wanted to say, when we're doing a pelvic exam, we don't always do the pap smear. So this is what the pap smear process looks like. It's looking at the vagina and the cervix kind of from the side. And so we will take a brush as well as a spatula, and we basically, we collect cells, again, from that surface of the, the canal where the, tra the transformation zone is, the, the, two, the border of two types of surfaces meet. And then here again, it's probably gonna be familiar if you've gone to your gynecologist. This is, I just wanted to show this because this is the brush. Typically that we'll use, is we'll use a spatula as well as a brush to collect cells from the cervix. And not only do we collect the pap smear from the cervix, when you're coming to see us, we also collect a sample for human papillomavirus testing. It's more modern now. We call it a smear because back uh, decades ago, we used to smear the cells on the slides and look at it under the microscope. Now we have a, a more advanced ways. We, we use a more liquid base and then the pathologists have their methods of evaluating the cells. I'll get back more to HPV, but I just kind of wanted to mention sort of the schedule of when pap smears and HPV testing, human papillomavirus testing should occur. These are based on the latest guidelines. They, I've only been practicing OBGYN for the past eight years since graduating from residency in 2009, but I'm gonna have to say it's changed a couple times even since I graduated from residency. 
So now it is recommended to start doing pap smears in our female patients at the age of 21. And this is regardless of sexual debut or regardless of when that patient started having sex. So starting at age of 21. From 21 to about 25, typically we'll only check a pap smear. We don't check for human papillomavirus because it's so ubiquitous that it's, it's not going to change our management to know whether you have it or not at that age group. From 25 and above though, then we start checking for it, HPV as well as the pap smear. If you have never had an abnormal pap smear and you don't have risk factors for being exposed to human papillomavirus, you can actually stop getting pap smears at age 65. But I just wanted to no note that about 15% of cervical cancers do occur above the age of 65. And this might have something to do with a couple of things, maybe a new partner or exposure, maybe partner has been exposed to HPV and given it to that patient. But there's also a theory that there might be reactivation of prior HPV infection that can lead to this. And this is information sort of pooled between the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the American Cancer Society. What are the highest types of HPV and that can cause cervical cancer? There are, like I said, two, over 200 types of HPV. Many don't do anything. Some just cause warts. And then these are the, the types, the numbers that, that can cause changes that can lead to cancer of the cervix, vagina, vulva, anus, as well as the throat, as well as penile cancers, by the way. The first two here, 16 and 18, are the most important. Those two cause 70% of cervical cancers and about 90% of anal cancers. The other numbers, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, basically account for another 20% of cervical cancers. And then these other types are the non-cancer causing types. Uh, 6 and 11 are responsible for causing 90% of genital warts. So that's why those two are emboldened. And the other reason why these particular numbers are in bold are because those are the virus types that the HPV vaccine will immunize against. So the good news is there is a vaccine available. So all vaccines are, are usually comprised of a virus-like particle. In terms of the human papillomavirus vaccine, it's the L1 particle. L1 is a DNA that codes for, I think, the capsid or the envelope, the covering of the virus. Before, when we started giving out the HPV vaccines, the two that were available were the bivalent vaccine and the quadrivalent vaccine. Bivalent being that protected against 16 and 18. And these, are, of course, are the most important because they're the most highly associated with cervical cancer and tumors. The quadrivalent is probably the one that I've given the most in the different clinics I've worked at. It protected against 6 and 11, 16 and 18. 6 and 11, of course, are the two associated with warts. Now, in the United States, the, one that, the only one we're going to get is a nine-valent vaccine. So if you have kids and you go to the pediatrician, this is what they're going to get. And it protects against these forms of HPV, 6 and 11, again. And 16 and 18 are the most commonly associated with cancer, 70%. And these other ones confer protection against 20% of cervical cancers. So these vaccines are designed to be a safe way to prevent an initial HPV infection. When you prevent this infection, then you're, you're preventing the di associated diseases that you can get, get from it, particularly warts and cervical cancer. It is, and I highly recommend it, not just to give it to female patients, but also to the males. So it, it, uh, in the male population, it does provide direct benefit. Uh, there is such a thing as penile cancer. It's super rare. Only about 2,000 men will get it in our population here in, in the United States. It is more common for, for uh, they also can though get anal cancers as well as throat cancers. But the reason why it's important to vaccinate males aside from the direct benefit that they get is because it does, it, it, pr it promotes herd immunity. Basically, it promotes the immunity against these HPV types in, your whole, in a whole, the whole population that you're vaccinating. Uh, and, even, and even perverse indirect effect on people who, who end up not getting vaccinated. So basically, if you, if you want your kids to, if you have a room full of kids and you want them to stop playing with, uh, oh, I don't know, candy. You want to stop eating candy. What's the best way to get them to stop sharing and, and giving out candy and eating it? Well, take it away. So that's kind of the, the, the uh, thinking behind giving the HPV vaccine. Now, just of note, these vaccines are for preventing 
infection with HPV, it will not help you get rid of an HPV infection if it's already there. There are actually vaccines and medications that are in the works that are being uh, tested and researched in order to maybe help in, actual, in actually getting rid of an HPV infection, but those are not available in the United States. All right, so when do we give them? So this is really important. Many of us who would, would you know, be listening to this or going to a talk that talks about HIV are likely gonna be too old to get the vaccine, but we will have kids. And so in, in, amongst our daughters, our female population, the recommendation is to give the HPV vaccine, the brand is called Gardasil 9, by age 11 to 12. But it can be given to uh, girls as young as nine years of age. If you're not able to give it to them at that 11 to 12 years of age, there is catch-up vaccination. It can be given from 13 to 26 years of age. We don't really recommend it beyond uh, routinely giving it to women older than 26 because the benefit is less. There's a higher chance that they've already been infected by a higher risk type of HIV. It's not routinely recommended, but in certain situations, for example, women who've never been sexually active, so no chance really of being exposed to a, a high risk form of HPV or who've been in a monogamous relationship, one partner, then there may be a potential benefit for them getting the vaccine even older than 26 if there is a chance that they will be exposed to HPV in the future. And if the, for patients who do want to get the vaccine regardless, even though they're older than 26, it, you can. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily going to harm you, although a lot of the studies don't include the population greater than 26 in terms of safety and efficacy, and it may not be covered by insurance. Okay, so for the boys, we also recommend vaccinating at the same age range, 11 to 12 years, can be given as young as nine years. And again, catch-up vaccination can be done also uh, from the age of 13 to 21 years of age. Now, there are some male populations that are at higher risk, and these are especially the males who have a disease that compromises their immune system, and those would be diseases such as human immunovirus or HIV, or patients who have uh, an autoimmune disease, a disease where they're lacking in uh, immunoglobulins or antibodies, they can't make certain antibodies, and also, for example, patients who, or who have had a transplant. They're on drugs that help them to prevent rejection of organs, and so they're at risk for it. So in these populations, it is recommended, even though they're older than 21, to undergo catch-up immunization. What's the schedule? So with the HPV vaccine, the Gardasil 9, it's not just one shot. <laughs> there, it's kind of like other, we do have other forms of uh, vaccines, for example, the hepatitis B series, where you, you do have to get a series of shots. So for patients younger than 15, both boys and girls, it is recommended to get two doses. So well, the first dose would be at zero months, and then the next dose will be at six to 12 months. So a two dose regimen. Patients who are 15 years or older, it's recommended to get three doses. So again, at zero, the first dose, and then the second dose would be one to two months after, and then the third dose would be six months after. Again, in immunocompromised patients, a little bit of a different population because of their risk. Regardless of age, they should get the three vaccine series. And another thing about it is it can be given together with other age-appropriate vaccines as long as it's given at a different site of the body. And just as a, as a personal aside, my daughter's actually got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. She's 10 years old. She's going to be turning 11 uh, in January. My husband and I have both decided that she will be getting the HPV vaccine along with her flu shot. So not going to be fun for her, but I like to... I like to tell patients what I would do for my own family and myself, and that is a decision that my husband and I have decided for our own child. What is the benefit? What, what have we seen? The, va the vaccine has been around since 2006. Not the nine-valent one, but at least the quadrivalent one, the one that protects against four types of HPV, 6, 11, 16, and 18. Well, we've seen more recently there, there has been a study that looked at populations of girls 14 to 19, and it's seen a 64% drop in HPV infections of 6, 11, 16, and 18, from 11.5% to 4.3%. There's a little bit less of a drop with the females in the older age range, but it's gone down from 18.5 to 12.1%. And this is even after a uh, suboptimal vaccination rate. The vaccination rate amongst girls is only 54%. So you can imagine that by improving the vaccination rate, we can get this to go down even further. Yes, it's important to stop the HPV infections or be able to, to curb the rates of it, but we wanna also see how is it affecting 
the, the things that we're afraid of, particularly cervical precancer and cervical cancer. Well, more recent studies have shown that amongst low-grade cervical dysplasia, so this isn't cancer yet, these are the precancer stages. Cervical, we, our general term for precancer uh, for the cervix is cervical dysplasia. The more clinical or pathological term would be cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. There are three grades, one, two, and three. So we've seen a 10% decrease in the low grade, CIN1, and we've seen a 50% decrease in the rate of the high grade, CIN2 or 3. These two are the two more common grade, uh, more scary grades. This is, with this grade, there's a less of a chance of regression and more of a chance of progression over time. The vaccine, again, has only been around since 2006. And as you can see, we haven't really been that great at vaccinating all of our female population, as well as our male population. There's been only a 54% rate of girls being populated at the age range of 11 to 12 years old. So it's kind of too early to see really what the effects are on cervical cancer. It does take many years to develop cervical cancer. So that's likely something we're going to see further down, further down the road. Another thing I just wanted to mention, it's with the combination of both the pap smear and the HPV vaccine, we really should be able to get the rates of cervical cancer down, down to zero. It's really a disease that we should be able to get rid of, just like polio. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending my my community talk and I'll be happy to field any questions.